Greetings everyone, I'm Mar, and once again this is my opinion, coming at you with another episode of First Impressions, the video series where I give my initial thoughts on a handful of topics. Today it is a 1997 horror film I heard about over a decade ago when I picked up the VHS copy of Boogeyman the Killer compilation. This is one of the lesser known films that was included in the compilation. It is the Scott Reynolds directed film set and made in New Zealand, The Ugly, starring, starring Paolo Rotondo, Rebecca Hobbs, Jennifer Ward Leland, and Roy Ward. Uh, the film is interesting. It's low budget, and at times you can tell that the film did not have a lot of money. I actually am not able to find exactly how much. Both Wikipedia and IMDb do not list a budget. I do know it was made in association with the New Zealand Film Commission, so they uh, probably provided a lot of the funds via grants and uh, other ways of getting money. And then it was released through Trimark Pictures. And according to Wikipedia, it had one video release in the late 90s. And I'm assuming that the copy I managed to get for over $30 on Amazon is from this original release or a later re-release of the same DVD that I saw once in stores in the mid-2000s. I didn't pick it up. But I do recognize the case that I am holding, and it is, thankfully, for the unrated edition. Now, before I get too far into this, I will say I actually like this film. I was wondering, after seeing the trailer and then reading about this film, am I going to end up liking it? But I did. And I have to agree with some of these reviews that are on here. A chilling and frightening mind game. That is from uh, Tony Timpon of Fangoria. The Ugly is a Little Beauty, a tricky, stylish horror turning the screws of suspense. David Stratton of Variety. That is very true. It is stylistic. And even though you can see it's uh, low budget at times, it is very well made. I would, uh, even though it's not going to make the same mark as the film I'm about to compare it to, I would compare it to Halloween in that regards. A brilliantly bold psychological tale of dementia. Karen Tom, cover magazine. Definitely true, especially when it comes to the character of Simon. Now, the plot of the film is that it takes place in an insane asylum in New Zealand, run by a Dr. Marlowe. Simon Cartwright, who is uh, Paolo's character, is a dangerous serial killer who is being held there. And he is seeking an appeal from a psychiatrist for a, re for a reevaluation, if I can even talk tonight. That is where Dr. Karen Shoemaker, Rebecca Hobbs' character, comes into the, into the film. She had just finished a case where she had gotten another serial killer a successful appeal. And uh, that's why Simon requested she come and listen to him. She shows up, and from the beginning, we could tell not all is as it seems. Simon seems very demure, but given the fact he's a violent serial killer, it's probably an act. And as we see when his first couple talks with Karen, that is apt. But also the two orderlies, Philip and Robert, they are overly mean to him. Let's just say this, that if these two characters were doing this in the United States, there would be massive grounds for relocation. Especially with one scene where they cover up the video and hit him. It's like, it would be obvious to anyone. That's a hand in front of the camera, but this is New Zealand. Who knows what in the 90s what type of technology they had in there. Now, as Karen interviews Simon, he slowly reveals that he had a traumatic childhood. His mother was very controlling, very abusive, both physically and mentally. She didn't tell him about his father, but as we find out later, his father actually wanted to raise him. He had money, but his mother was very controlling, probably a little upset about the breakup. And uh, uh, it's very subtly hinted that she might hate men following this. It's Nothing major is brought up, so maybe it's just her resentment towards that particular man, but there's a little bit there. And uh, this part kind of reminded me a little bit of Norman Bates' relationship with his mother, only I'd say a lot worse, because I don't remember 
there being any hints of physical abuse. Maybe a little mental control, but not physical abuse. So this took it to that next level. Now, as you can kind of guess, eventually Simon does become a murderer. His first victim is his mother, and his mother is one of the few people he kills in this film who I would say deserved it. I'm not going to spoil who the other two are for now, but th she definitely deserved it. And he starts killing people, and he eventually kills a woman he loves. I'm not going to spoil the context of it, but I knew about this scene already because this is the scene that's featured in Boogeyman. So if you saw that compilation, you already know about that. But seeing that scene out of context... It still felt sad because, like, especially with how the that scene's edited, where it keeps go, jumping back and forth in time. But seeing it in the context of the film, where we actually see him meet her as when they're kids, and then seeing later when they meet up again as adults, it's like, oh, it's even sadder. He had a chance in a normal life, and there it went. To add on to the abuse thing, he was also bullied in school by, by other kids. He was dyslexic. Which is why he did not have good reading skills, and why he uh, read The Ugly Duckling. Which is where the title The Ugly comes into play. And they show this in the film in two other ways. Is that every now and then we'll see that Simon views himself as scarred based on an old injury that he got from these bullies. He's not really scarred, but it's how he sees himself. So every now and then you'll see like a makeup effect on his right side, but then when it cuts away, we see that's just his own inner turmoil. And uh, another thing that ties into this is how they show the blood, because every time he kills someone, we do see a good amount of gore, more so in this version, since this is the uncut version of the film. But it is black blood. So it's one of those weird things where like, if it's red, no, 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 you gotta be, you gotta show the right amount, no, we can't make it too overly gory. But you make it blue, you make it black, you make it green. Call down, pal. You can, you can go to your heart's content. You throw it all. It's such good shit. Now, the reason that they went this route, this is mainly coming from IMDb, but even without that, it'd be pretty obvious what they're going for is that it's the film's way of showing through the cinematography and the special effects that Simon does not view his victims as human and it works and of course with that one at the end it adds to the tragedy and it's after that that Simon was caught by the way I, mean, I think we kinda see that coming now one little thing that is slowly built up is that Simon says he hears voices off and on there's little subtle hints in the background and it's like, well, what is this? Now, based on the scene out of context, I thought it was going to reveal he's actually possessed by demons or spirits that are imploring him to kill. But it's actually tied in to his psychological state. This is why I compared him to Norman Bates. In that instead of creating an alternate personality to where he gives life to his mother, it's like his impulses spurred on by the abuse and feelings related to it, have created this other side of him that implore him to kill, so all his negative impulses are in that, and they're manifesting themselves in the form of the women he kills. So every time he kills someone else, he adds another person to the list. I shouldn't have just said women, because he has killed men too. So everyone he kills adds another thing to it. And as he puts it in the film... They won't leave me alone until I've done it, and each time it gets harder and harder and harder not to. With that, so, every time he adds a new one to the list, it gets harder to control these impulses because it's one more voice that are imploring him to kill. Now, there are a couple weird little moments with this that's like, okay, if it's all supposed to be a side of him, how does that work? Uh, it looks like it's very, very subtly shown in the film, but the Wikipedia article makes it a little bit more clear that Simon has psychic powers. And it's shown only a couple times. There's that scene you see in the trailer where the uh, straps on his uh, bed come undone. There's a weird little moment where he says goodnight to Karen and she like senses him and wakes up like, what the? And then, of course, him getting out and Karen being able to see the ugly when she is almost killed by him at one point. I'm not going to spoil the context of that scene, but... 
it's one of the ones that made me think, is there going to be spirits or demons in this film? But nope. So the whole psychic power thing, it, with how the rest of the film, it does come off a little weird, but at least it's not as bad as, say, the rest of the film being serious and then the devil showing up at the end. It's very subtly done. And you can still kind of make the argument that maybe it's all just in his head and the only reason that uh, Karen sees it is because of suggestion. But the way Dr. Marlow and the others react, he probably does have it. It's just very, very subtle and only when that part of his psyche's coming out. If they had more money to play with, they probably would have made it a little bit more blatant, but that's one of the times where the film's lower budget actually helps the film, because if they had made the psychic power thing a little bit more blatant, it probably would have hurt the film a lot more. Acting-wise, Paulo Rotondo does an excellent job as Simon. You hate him when he's doing the murders, even though you feel for him, because we know the abuse he's going through. The scenes where he is showing sympathy, especially the scene where he kills his love, you really feel for him because you know he's a he's a tortured soul. Even though he is committing these heinous crimes, you could see that he doesn't want to do it. He's being made to literally by himself, by another side of him. It's not like Dr. Lecter where he gets perverse pleasure out of doing the acts. It's not like Buffalo Bill where he's doing it to get something. He literally is being forced to do it by himself. It's almost like he's holding himself at knife point. And of course all the voices don't help. Rebecca Hobbs does a great job as Karen. She's very very strong, very to the point. At one point it really calls Simon out on the way he's wording things and yells at him. But of course you could tell she's overconfident and uh, Dr. Marlowe even points this out and with what happens to her in the end I'm not going to spoil but you can kind of see it coming. And I like the way the film does play it out. Roy Ward does a great job as Dr. Marlowe. He has the right amount of acting to it, but he also has the right amount of distant coldness with, with how the film goes. You see why he's playing in that way. Paul Glover and Christopher Graham as Philip and Robert the Orderlies. They were just jerks the entire time, so when they got a comeuppance near the end, it was well-deserved. I'm not going to give any spoilers about that. Uh, Jennifer Ward Leland did a great job as Evelyn Cartwright, that's Simon's mother. She was very hateable from the word go. And Vanessa Bimes as Julie. You really saw the chemistry she had with uh, Paulo in the film. And even though it's only in a couple scenes, if they had filmed a couple more scenes to show the relationship more instead of just Simon narrating it, probably would have been a good, better time to actually see their chemistry. And you feel sad for Simon when he killed Julie in that one scene, but... And sadly, Vanessa didn't do anything major of note. I actually looked through a lot of their filmographies. A bunch, a handful of these actors were in episodes of Xena and Hercules' The Legendary Journeys, which, considering that those are filmed in New Zealand, no surprise there. And uh, sadly, Scott did not go on to do anything major of note following this, so this is his one big high point. Which is sad, considering that the trailer, one of the critics who saw it, compared it favorably to Reservoir Dogs, in the fact that it's the best debut film for a director he had seen since Reservoir Dogs. Well, I wouldn't put it on the same level, it is a pretty good film and it won a lot of awards. It won the Best Actor Award for Paul Paulo at the Fanta Festival that year. Won International Fantasy Film Award, Outstanding First Feature Film for Scott, Best Actress, Best Film at the New Zealand Film TV Awards and those are just a couple of the awards it won so it's a shame that at least Scott didn't go on to do anything else. It's a very effective uh, thriller horror film, and it's a shame that its DVD has been out of print for a while. And as, as I mentioned before, it costs at least thirty dollars to get a hold of it. If if you could find it in a pawn store or anything for a decent price, I'd say pick it up and watch it. And hopefully, this is a film that one of these days gets re-released in one of those multiple film packs that you see. And I doubt Shout Factory would ever do a special edition of this film unless it somehow becomes a cult classic. Thankfully, I'm not the only YouTube reviewer who has seen and has reviewed this film. There's a handful of other reviewers out there, so at least it's not one of those films that's going to die in obscurity. Uh, hopefully, uh, there's a release soon that uh, can help more people see this, or at least it gets shown on uh, TV more. 
Uh, rating wise, I'd probably put it at least in that 3.5 range. You'd have to watch it a couple more times to set that in stone, but it's around there.